The writer of the book of Hebrews says that the word of God is living and active. Powerful. It, it pierces through to the very core of our being, discerning the thoughts and intentions of our hearts. The psalm writer says that the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. And so the word of God is powerful to expose our, our sin and, and show us our need for a savior. And it is rich with mercy and, and serves as a balm to soothe our hurting souls, to give us life. I'm humbled by the opportunity this morning to be at Bethany Community Church. To be here and to open this word, this living word, in order to be taught, in order to be fed by the author of this word, the one true and living God. We're going to read together from 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. And Peter is writing this, this letter to a, to a group of believers who have been scattered throughout this region known as Asia Minor. Today we call it Turkey. And the believers were undergoing persecution. And Peter was aware of this and he knew that this persecution wasn't going to stop. In fact, it was likely going to increase. And so he writes this letter to the believers. And his purpose in doing so is to in, encourage the believers to endure suffering and tribulation in the present age. Peter writes this letter to encourage the believers to endure suffering and tribulation in the present age. So I would ask you now, if you would stand in honor of God, and we will read his word together. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through 16. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Let's pray together. Almighty God, you are holy. We've sang of your holiness. Holy, holy, holy are you. And so we're here this morning to worship you to exalt our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I pray that you would give us hearts that are open to receive your truth. Come and be our teacher. Father, help me to be faithful to your word. We pray in Christ's name, amen. If you were to ask a new believer, someone who has recently come to faith in Christ, if you were to, to approach them and say, tell me about your faith. Tell me what it's like now that you're a Christian. They, they would likely say something like this. Ever since I came to Christ, it feels like this weight has been lifted off of my shoulders. This weight that was strapped to my back, I, I don't feel it anymore. It's great. I, I can sleep at night because I know that, that if I die, I, I'm going to spend eternity with my Lord. I don't fear death anymore. And it's strange, when I come to church on Sundays, now what, what the preacher's saying, it, it makes sense. It, in fact, I, I desire to hear that. They would likely say something like that, and, and they may say something like this. Ever since I've come to faith in Christ, it, it, it seems like I'm more keenly aware of the devil. I'm in a battle now. I, I'm more aware of, of, of the enemy and, and his ways, and, and there's this struggle going on all the time. And those of us who have been believers for any length of time, we can identify with that, can't we? The Christian life is hard. I came to Christ in my early 20s, and I can remember a, a situation soon after my conversion where I, I was faced with a difficult decision at work which was going to require me to make some difficult choices. A, a, a man approached me and he gave me some specific instructions about how I was supposed to handle a, a particular invoice. W what he asked me to do or, or instructed me to do was to take this invoice and uh, I want you to put a little extra on here. I want you to pad this just a little bit. 
Now, I knew what he was asking me to do was not right. It was dishonest. I knew the Lord wouldn't be honored in that, but in that moment, there was pressure. There there was pressure to, to revert back to who I was not so long ago before that. Well, by God's grace, I, I told the man, I, I can't do this. I can't do it. It's not right. He was visibly upset about it. And he, he warned me that he would have to speak with my employer about the situation and, and share with him my decision. And, and he did. I didn't lose my job over it. But the point is this. When we are faced with the difficulties of life, there is pressure on us. I could have shared numerous situations where the similar pressures were on me and I caved. I went back to who I was before coming to Christ. When faced with the pressures of life, we are prone to give in to the desires of our flesh. When faced with the pressures of life, we are prone to give in We're prone to revert back to who we were before coming to Christ. Since this is true then, since this is true for us, what will motivate us? What what will motivate us to live as we are called? What will be our motivation to live holy lives? In the text before us, Peter teaches us that because God who called us is holy, we must be holy. Peter teaches us that because God who called us is holy, we must be holy. And so if this is the instruction, if this, if this is the command from Scripture, we have to ask the question, well, what does it mean to be holy? And I suppose we, we could spend a, a lot of time discussing this topic of holiness, the holiness of God, And it would be time well spent, wouldn't it? But for this morning, uh, this concise definition uh, will work. It will be sufficient. To be holy is to be separate from sin. Wayne Grudem adds this. To be holy is to be separate from sin and to be devoted to God. It's helpful, isn't it? Separate from sin, devoted to God. And so Peter instructs the readers to be holy in all your conduct because God is holy. But not only does Peter give the instruction to live a holy life, but he explains to the readers how they can do this. We learn from this passage then that we live holy lives by remembering who we are in Christ. We live holy lives by remembering who we are in Christ. Verse 13 begins with this word, therefore. And when we see this word, we know that something is demanded of us. Therefore demands something of us. It demands that we look back on what has been written. And so as as we do this, we look back over the first 12 verses that, that Peter has written. And we see that he has done several things. He teaches the believers. He teaches the believers, here's who you are. And then he explains their salvation. He wants them to understand what has happened to them. And then he tells them what they can expect as children of God. Verse 1, he says this, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles. And in these two little words, elect exiles, we learn a great deal. They're packed full of meaning. To be elect is to be chosen. Peter says, Believers, here's who you are. You're chosen of God. God has handpicked you, as it were, for salvation. It was commonplace in the Old Testament. We, we see the children of Israel oftentimes referred to as Israel, the chosen people, God's chosen people. For example, in Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 6, it says, For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. And so Peter opens like this. Here's who you are, believer. But I want you to know something. You're an exile. You're a pilgrim. This world is not your home. You don't belong here. You're born again, but you don't belong here. You're looking forward to something yet to come. Peter then goes on and explains to them what has happened. In verse 3, he blesses God. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again. To a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Peter wants them to know, you've been changed. You've been born again. You're not who you once were. And so he wants them to know this. The life of the Christian is a life of hope. You've been born again to a living hope, he says. Peter then tells them, having identified, here's who you are. You are elect exiles. You are chosen of God. You're in a place that is not your home. You're, you're just passing through here. I want you to know what happened. You've been born again. You've been changed. But now I need to tell you, Christian, here's what you can expect. As a child of God, living in this place that you cannot call home, expect this, verse 6, expect tribulation. Tribulation. Verse 6 says this, In this you rejoice, that is your salvation, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. Expect it. Remember, Peter is writing to a group of believers who've been scattered throughout this region because of their faith. And they were presently undergoing persecution, and it was going to continue, and so he wants them to know that. So we see the first way to live a holy life is to remember who we are in Christ. I was recently speaking with a friend of mine, and he and his wife have a beautiful family. They have five children. Four of their children are biological, and they've adopted a son. And so I asked him, do you ever have to remind your son uh, that he's yours? And he didn't miss a beat. He said, every day. I said, what do you mean every day? He said, I have to tell him every day, I love you. Mommy and daddy love you. Mommy and daddy sought you out. We, we, we went after you and we brought you home and, we, and you're ours now. You belong in this home. He said because there's some confusion sometimes, some, some identity issues that he has to fight through. You belong here. We, like the readers to whom Peter wrote, must remember who we are. That God has made us his own. Peter doesn't give us this instruction to live holy lives in the abstract. He doesn't just throw this out here and say, let's get it together, guys. Clean up your act. We aren't called to to clean it up and and hope that our our, our working is is somehow going to make us acceptable to God. That that once we we reach this certain point, that God will smile on us with favor and say, Ha, now, the opposite is true. The Lord pursues sinners. And Peter says, remember, God has called you. He's chosen you. He's made you his own. Out of this righteous standing that we have because of what Christ has done, flows a life of holiness. It's important for us to remember this because when we're tempted to indulge our flesh, when we're tempted to to lust after people or things, when we're tempted to respond in anger at a certain injustice that that we've been the recipient of, or or perhaps a child, one of our children has, has suffered something, and we're tempted to respond in anger. We remember who we are. We remember who God has made us by his grace. We don't stop there, however, on, on this quest for holiness. We, we move forward by setting our hope on grace. We live holy lives by setting our hope on grace. Verse 13 continues, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. What do we need to know about this hope? We commonly refer to hope as as a desire for something to happen. I remember a couple years ago, our family was traveling down to uh, Branson, Missouri for a vacation. And we're driving along the interstate, and uh, I wasn't paying attention. I happened to look down and, and see that the gas gauge is on E. And I'm thinking, this is not good. 
uh, it's hot out. We have a van full of kids and there's nothing <laughs> within sight. I hope we make it to the next gas station. This is often how we think about hope. But Peter has something remarkably different in mind. I did make it to the gas station, by the way. But, but Peter, Peter, when he refers to hope, he, he's saying a confident expectation of what is to come. We've mentioned back in verse 3 that Peter says, you've been born again to a living hope. Through what? Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Peter is saying this, you've been born again to a living hope. Because of what Christ has done, he's been raised from the dead, you now have hope, a living hope. And as sure as Christ was raised from the dead, he's coming again. Christ one day will come back and he will be fully and finally revealed. Peter says, set your hope on that. Set your hope on the grace that is to come. One commentator says this. We could interpret this verse like this. Your one hope should be, your one hope should be what God will do for you when Christ is finally and fully revealed. We will finally realize the grace, the inheritance that is ours. We'll be free from the enticements of the world. Oh, wait. We'll be free from our flesh. We'll be set free from the temptations that bring us down. And, and we will forever reign with our Savior. Peter says, set your hope on that. You see, our salvation is, is both a present and a future reality. We see this all throughout Scripture. This, what we call the already and the not yet. We are presently enjoying salvation. As people of God, we, we, we live uh, abundant lives, don't we? We have peace with God. I could stop there. We have peace with God. God is no longer angry at those who have put their faith in his son. And so we enjoy this. We have fellowship with each other. You know, this thing that we're doing here on Sunday mornings, this, this body of believers, this community of believers, this is unique to Christianity. This fellowship we enjoy, moving out of state has brought this reality even clearer, made this reality clearer to me. And those of you who have traveled out of the country have seen this. You can bear witness to this. You, you travel across the globe and, and when you meet up with believers, there is a bond there, right? Because of what Christ has done. You see, we're enjoying our lives as believers right now. And yet we know that there is something greater to come. Do you remember when you were 15 years old? Or perhaps you have a child or a grandchild who is 15 years old. When you're 15, you, you come home with a slip of paper in your hand. And this paper gives you uh, the right to drive the family car. For some of us, that was more or less of a glamorous experience. But either way, you got to do that. The condition was... Mom or dad had to be in the front seat with you, or in the passenger seat. And that was a great time. There, there was a, a, an element of freedom there where you got to drive. You were kind of in control and you enjoyed that. But you knew that come 16, there was going to be something new and different. Something even greater than what you were enjoying. Peter says, set your hope on the grace that is to come. He answers the question then, how do we do this? How do we set our hope on grace? He gives us two ways. First of all, he says, preparing your minds for action. This literally says, gird up the loins of your mind. And we say, that's strange language, isn't it? What do you mean, gird up the loins? It's taken from the ancient Eastern nations where, where men dress differently. Not slacks, but, but long robes. And so as the men would prepare to exert themselves in some way, they would stoop down and, and pull up their robes and tuck them into their belt or their girdle. And in so doing, they were girding themselves for action. So, so Peter takes this imagery and he applies it to the Christian mind. He says, get ready to think. Get ready to engage your mind. You see, Christians, as Christians, we are called to be thinking people. We don't come to Christ and, and leave our minds back here. 
Set your hope on grace by preparing your minds for action. It's difficult to keep our minds focused. Thinking is hard work. But God, through the Apostle Peter, is calling us to this. Engage your minds for action. We ought to be thinking about the meaning, what, what, what this life means, knowing that this life has uh, ramifications for eternal life. What we do in this life matters for eternity. And when I think about someone who is, who is focused, someone who is engaged, I picture uh, someone who's getting ready to run the hurdles. Right? And you can picture that. They, they're fixing their feet in the blocks. And as they, they put their hands on the tape and, and they're waiting for the gun to go off, they have one thing on their mind, right? How can I get from this point to that finish line as quickly as possible? And the gun goes off and they take off running and you see they are focused on that finish line and they're jumping those hurdles as if they're not there, right? Those distractions that are in front of them, they're moving past. We are called as people of God to prepare our minds for action. And Peter says that the next way that you do this, the next way that you set your hope on grace is, is by being sober-minded. Being sober-minded. When we think of sobriety, we often think of not being intoxicated by alcohol. When a person is, is drunk with alcohol, his senses become dull. He becomes careless and, and indifferent to his surroundings and he starts to believe that he can do things that, that are beyond his ability. And while this would be uh, appropriate to make application here, live holy lives by not being drunk with alcohol, Peter has something more in mind. He, he's using this in a metaphorical way to apply to the whole Christian life. Be sober-minded, he says. As I was studying this passage, I was helped several times by Tom Schreiner's very helpful commentary. I would commend it to you if you're interested in digging a bit deeper in 1 Peter. But here's what he says about this verse. There is a way of living that becomes dull to the reality of God. Okay, so the, here is this way of living. There, there's a way of living that becomes dull to the reality of God that is anesthetized by the attractions of the world. Do you see the picture? There, there's this way of living, and here it is. And it, it's dull to the reality of God, and that way has become anesthetized by the attractions of the world. In other words, there, there's a way of living in the world where we become so in. Uh, so comfortable with the enticements that, that they become commonplace to us that uh, we're not able to discern. Most of us can identify with this. Most of us have been to the dentist for something more than a routine teeth cleaning. And you know the routine and whether you're going to have a, a cavity filled or a tooth pulled you sit in the chair and uh, the hygienist takes that ointment and rubs a little on your gum and uh, you wait a few minutes and then they bring out that needle and, and they're going to give you a little shot and sometimes you feel more than the prick they told you about but either way they do this and, and before long you're, you're numb and they go ahead and proceed with the operation you make your way out and pay and make your way to your car and as you're walking there you, you begin to tug on your cheek right because it feels strange. There, there's no feeling there. And, and then if you're like me, you get into your car. First you check to make sure no one is around. And then you, you look at yourself in the mirror just to make sure that your jaw is not hanging down on your chest. Because that's the way it feels. You see, you've become anesthetized. Right? There's, there's, you've become insensitive. And the, the, the world has a way of dulling our senses. And Peter is concerned about this. He doesn't want the believers to be lulled into complacency by dwelling on the present Life. Remember, set your hope being sober minded. He wants their consciences to be sharp. He uses this, this phrase sober minded it, in two other places. Turn over to chapter 4 and verse 7. Chapter 4 and verse 7. It says, The end of all things is at hand. 
Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. He's saying, Jesus is coming soon. The end is near. Be sober-minded. In chapter 5 and verse 8, again, he says, Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. So so we learn, Jesus is coming soon. The end is near. Be sober-minded. And by the way, you have an enemy. You have an adversary. And he's seeking to destroy your life. Be sober-minded. We live in a culture where where entertainment is, is prized above almost anything, it seems. Anything, anything we can do to, to keep it light. See, we, we, we don't like to dwell on, on the realities of living in a fallen world. But God is calling us through the Apostle Peter to a life of sobriety. This doesn't mean that we walk around with a frown on our face. Right? That would be a contradiction, wouldn't it? We have Christ. Christ. Regardless of the difficulties of this life, we know that there is something more to come. But he is calling us to a sober way of thinking. We set our hope on grace by by thinking about this life. To know that what I do in this life, no matter how short, matters for eternity. Where I spend my money now matters for eternity. What I teach my children now matters for eternity. There's encouragement in this verse as well. Because we set our hope on grace that is to come. And in that is the realization that regardless of the difficulty of this life. Some of you are called right now to endure difficulty. To endure trials that are, uh, that are very hard. But there is hope here. Set your hope on what is to come, Peter says. Not only do we set our hope on grace, but we live holy lives then by not falling back into our old ways. We live holy lives by not falling back into our old ways. Verse 14 says, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. When we started, we, we said, uh, Peter was identifying to the believers, here's who you are. Re- remember your calling. To be, to be called by God is to be a child of God. Romans 8, 16 says this, the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And so Peter says here, as obedient children. Notice what he says, as obedient children. He does not say in order to become children. You see, Peter's instructions are grounded in what Christ has accomplished. As obedient children, here's who you are. Remember verse 1? As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. You see, obedience is a mark of genuine Christianity. To be a Christian is to be obedient to Christ. When you turn from your sin and placed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are submitting yourselves to the lordship of Christ. And to be under the lordship of Christ means that Christ is Lord over every area of our lives. He is Lord over my time. Christ is Lord over my finances. He's Lord over my hobbies. Christ is Lord over my relationships. And so Peter is calling the people, the believers, here's who you are as obedient children. And if you're sitting here saying, you know, I've been working at this for a long time. And I'm not sure that I know this, this holy God who requires holiness from his people. Today is the day of grace. The Lord Jesus hasn't returned. There is time. And so you say, oh, how can I know this God? There's no amount of working. You you simply 
recognize, you, you agree with God that you have sinned against him. You have transgressed his holy law. And you turn from your sin and by faith you put your faith and your, your hope, your confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ who alone can save. And in so doing, you become a child of the king. Do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. These, these passions or evil de desires, the, the lusts of the flesh, what do we know about them? Well, Peter says, your former ignorance. These characterize the old way of life. Later in, the later in the book, he helps us understand something about these passions. In chapter 2, in verse 11, he says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of your flesh, which wage war against your soul. So we know two things. The, the passions of our flesh, they used to define us. This is who we were. We were slaves to the passions of our flesh. But now there's a battle. They wage war against your soul. And Peter says, don't be conformed to those. Don't be conformed to those passions, to that old way of life. So implicit in this command is believers act differently than unbelievers. Believers act differently than unbelievers. Does this surprise us? In chapter 3, in verse 15, it says this, But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. Peter is assuming that the believers are going to live a life that is so radically different from the world that people are going to question what they're doing. Why do these people uh, forego the family vacation? They said something like they're, they're saving up money to go on a mission trip. or uh, th th This family is going to fly to Ethiopia and they're bringing back children. They, they said they're adopting children into their family. Is this strange? You know, I was at work the other day, one might say, and, and, and my boss really got into it with another individual. They were accusing him of all these things and it was strange. He, he, he didn't hardly say anything back. Do people look at our lives and say, there is something different about them? What is it about you that is different? We are called to live a holy life. We are called to live a holy life by not falling back into our old ways. We don't manufacture this holiness. When we were born again, we were given the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes and, and indwells the believers, and he, he enables us to live a holy life. Peter says then in verse 15, we are to live holy lives in all our conduct. That is, in everything that we do. The applications for this are, are numerous. Opportunities all the time when, when we leave here and a, and a child knocks the plate off the, the dinner table, right, and it shatters on the floor, how do we respond? Or at work, you, you, you are tempted to compromise, compromise your integrity. There's an opportunity for holy living. We live in a time where, where pornography is more readily available than, than ever before. How will we respond? Will we respond with holy lives. And young women are, are, are tempted to compromise their purity. The pressures of the world are great. Peter says, remember who you are. Remember who God has called you and, and do not be conformed to those passions of your former ignorance. Living in a fallen world, the, the pressures on us are great. And inevitably, we are going to fall. We're going to fail to live that holy life that God has called us to live. We're going to sin. And so the question we have to ask is, how, how do, we, do we respond? Do we respond by uh, making excuses for why we did such and such a thing? Do we rationalize it away? 
Do we trust in our own ability to make it right? We're going to, uh, to, to work really hard and then, then God will see that I'm, I'm trying and then he will look with me, look at me with favor. Or do we do what the scripture called us, calls us to do? Do we acknowledge it? Do we acknowledge and, and repent, we turn from it and entrust our souls to, to the one who alone lived a holy life, the sinless son of God who, who has purchased us? Colossians said that, says that he nailed all of our sins to the tree. There's forgiveness and hope in our Savior. And we trust him, we trust his work. In the middle of the 16th century in uh, the Church of England, the Protestant Reformation was making progress. And one of the key figures in the Reformation there in the Church of England was the Archbishop of Canterbury at that time, Thomas Cranmer. And his, his Reformation was, was brought to, the progress of Reformation was brought to a screeching halt when Queen Mary took the throne. She later became known as, as Bloody Mary for her staunch opposition to anything Protestant, anything that denied the Catholic faith and allegiance to the Pope. And because of this, Cranmer found himself in prison. And for at least two years, he was treated harshly. He was humiliated. He was uh, physically mistreated, but after a couple of years, his captors realized that this harsh treatment wasn't working. They weren't able to break this man's faith by treating him harshly, so they tried something different. They, they thought, well, maybe if we, if we treat him lavishly, they wanted him to turn from his faith. And so they did this. They, they began to, to treat him very, very well. He was able to eat and and dress in, in fine clothing. And, and so they lavished this treatment on him. And sadly it worked. Over time the pressure. And the, the, the pressure to renounce your faith. And Cranmer was coerced into signing this document. In which he denied his faith. And he aligned himself under the Roman Catholic Church. And under the authority of the Pope. But this written uh, declaration was not enough for the authorities. They, they decided that, that Cranmer needed to make a public appearance and to tell the people, they, want, they wanted the people to hear it from his mouth that he denied his faith. And so the day was set. Cranmer was brought in front of the church, a packed church. And the people waited with anticipation to hear this once powerful reformer recant his faith. And he spoke for a while through tears. And then the people were surprised when he spoke these words. He said, And now I come to the great thing that so much troubles my conscience. More than anything that I ever did or said in my whole life. And that is the distribution of a writing that is contrary to the truth. Which I now here renounce and refuse. These things were written with my hand contrary to the truth that I believed in my heart. And written for fear of death to save my life if it might be. See, the, the pressure on Cranmer was so great. He denied what he knew to be true. But by God's grace, he was brought back around. He was restored. And then he said, And inasmuch as my hand has offended and written contrary to my heart, my hand shall first be punished. For when I come to the fire, it shall first be burned. He was then forced to the stake where he was chained and where he would give his life as a martyr for the faith. When the pressure was great, he fell. He succumbed to the pressure but he proved his genuine allegiance to the Lord Jesus Christ by, by remembering who he was. And in the power of the Spirit, he turned and he was faithful to his Lord. He gave his life as a martyr for the faith. May God give us the grace to live holy lives as we look forward to the day when his grace will be 
fully and finally revealed. Let's pray together. Almighty God, your grace is sufficient for us. In your mercy, you have called a people to yourself. You have made us your own. And so I pray that in this new week, we would remember this. We would remember who we are. And we would live lives of holiness for your glory. That others would know the Christ whom we love and serve. It's in his name we pray. Amen.